Hey everyone, good afternoon, or evening, morning, whatever it is when you watch this. Wanted to pop on today to comment a little bit about uh, the benefits of really getting well versed and practiced at your passion, even when the boring, tedious parts come up and why it's so beneficial to practice even the boring fundamentals, as some people might call it. Um, if you want a really fun sports analogy of that, which is weird coming from me because I can't, I just think sports are stupid. I mean, it's just me. I'm not a sports guy, so. But the story of uh, Vince Lombardi, uh, when he was a football coach in the NFL. <laughs> Go read the story if you want to, you know, get a sports angle on the the benefit of practicing fundamentals with your passions. Um, Go read that story. That one's kind of a fun one too. But the, the angle I'm coming from today with this uh, and, and it might seem kind of weird for me to say that the lesson I kind of was reminded of today that was a little bit fun for me to, I guess, rehash with some experience I had going through these, what people would call boring, you know, scales, scores, technical work, the, these samples today and uh, working on getting them really well quantized and tightened up good. I had this one track I worked on I was working on my B minor samples today and there was one one clip where I had I guess during the recording process I had not really paid attention to some of the things um, some little little littler details that uh, are now coming forth as I'm reviewing all these recordings and these clips I have I'm like, oh, how did I not catch that when I was recording this, you know? <laughs> um, little issues that, you know, if I leave them in there are going to cause problems. I uh, won't be able to really call it a professional sample library if I don't take care of those little issues. Just kind of some little timing and uh, once in a while I hear little like pops and clicks and things like that. Um, things that are easily fixed when you're doing uh, any uh, live audio editing. But one clip I came on today, uh, I was, I, I must have been like not paying attention too much to the, the noise, the little like kind of squeaky sometimes noises that you get. I don't know if you can hear that with my chair or not, but the squeaky noises and whatever else that you that come out when you're, you know, playing scales all the way up and down um, the piano across the entire um, range of the keyboard. And uh, I guess in one clip I had missed that when I was playing from the bottom up with both hands, the bench was creaking underneath me and I didn't catch it in the moment. I mean, because piano is louder than the, the, the you know, creak of the bench. <laughs> and so I must've missed that one. And uh, it was like, it was subtle, but just the frequency of the click from the bench when I was shifting on it um, very clearly came through in that specific recording of that sample. And I heard it, I'm like, oh, how did I miss this? Dang it. I'm like, well, easily, these are, you know, th usually these are pretty easily fixable. Um, there's a few ways to do it. Um, for those of you who don't want the nitty gritty details of this, feel free to fast forward um, to the, the uh, moral of the story I'll get to, if you can find it here in this video, that's fine. But for those who want to hear the details, it's, it was actually really interesting. And, and these actually matter. So these details matter in the context of it. So it might still be good to listen to if, even if you're not um, in the music production world or don't know much about audio editing. Um, the two ways that I usually go about fixing stuff like that um, is either to like zoom way in. I'll show you here really quick actually. You can zoom way, oops, there we go, sorry. You can zoom way into these, these waveforms really, really far in, right? So that you can see, you know, all the lines of the waveform. And usually what I'll do when I find a pop or a click like that is I'll go in there and you can actually just manually draw them out. Like you can draw the waveform, you can draw out the pops and clicks sometimes by doing that. Um, like, you know, complete the waveform if it's kind of like disrupted by something like that, right? You can draw and fix it out like that way. Um, another way, I've tried before and it, sometimes it works, is you can either use what's called a multi-band compressor. If you can isolate the frequency of that pop or click, you can just 
you know, drag your the bands in your multiband free, uh, multiband compressor and just find that frequency and then just drag it all the way down. That's a little more uh, difficult to do. Um, you can also EQ it out. Um, EQ is one of my favorite tools for mixing. But then again, that, that involves finding the frequency of the pop or the click and then just kind of dragging it down. A um, little more complicated there. And today, <laughs> none of the usual, and there's a few other things you can do, but none of the usual things I was doing was working to get rid of this. This little pop in the, it was like, a, like one or two notes, just kind of this little creak. And I'm like, I can't keep that in there. I have to get rid of it. Like, <laughs> if I want to be able to call this professional. And so what I ended up having to do was I got a little bit creative. Um, normally if I have to, um, well, and especially with the sample library, normally what um, I end up doing, if I find a note that's kind of like, you know, a little bit, I don't know, off, or if I'm like, I've accidentally like, you know, in my process of, play, process of playing a scale upwards, I'll, maybe I'll go a little bit too legato or something and end up fading one note into the next so that it's not as usable if people want to like cut and paste stuff when they're using these samples in the future. Um, and you know, I, you know, you don't want to have to like isolate one note and then you have a piece of another note in there because you just played it too legato and there's like multiple notes in there, there's harmonies or dissonance or whatever else that you don't want. Um, and so, but, but normally what I'll do um, when there's stuff like this, because I'm playing scales all the way up and back down, there are gonna be repeated notes in each clip, right? You have like, uh, say there's a, I don't know, just C4, for example. I'll be going up and I'll play like a, on the, the one-handed scales, I'll play a C4 going up, and then maybe the one on the, the way down is, uh, again, like maybe too legato or uh, maybe I'm playing, trying to play a staccato or something. And I want that one note to be just a little more staccato. Um, so I'll go to the other C4 on the way up or something, and then just take that one, stick it over on the other half, and okay, that okay, that that note is now staccato enough, short enough for me, right? So I'll do that sometimes, just kind of copying and pasting different parts of the clip. Um, I tried that as well, it wasn't working because <laughs> like it was, it's the, it was the range high enough on the piano where um, when you get to the really the, the very you know higher registers, um, it's a little bit harder to get um, like there, there's a more of a natural uh, pedal effect on the higher register when you're playing those notes, especially staccato. And I tried that with uh, this this uh, fix I was trying to do earlier, and I wasn't working because it was in a, in a high enough register that going it was i think it was on the way up and so the ones on the, the that instance of that note going back down had a little bit of the previous note in the scale overlapping you know because at that point no matter how staccato you get there's a little bit of you know, overlap between notes and I, it was so it was kind of adding a little bit of dissonance that i didn't want and i'm like oh how do i fix this so what i ended up doing and this is and this is where i get to the um why it's good to really practice your passions. Um, one of the reasons to, to you know really get used to the what it takes to get really high quality fundamental stuff down, uh, whether it's piano or anything else, is because when it comes times like this where nothing else I usually do, do was working, I got a little bit creative with it. And because I'm well practiced at, at, at editing these audio clips in much more complicated settings than just scales, um, I was able to go in and I took like half of the, like just like from the, the attack of the note, I think maybe about a third of the way through it, stopped, like cut, cut the clip, I split it right before that pop came in, went to the last half of the note, cut it there, um, trying to make sure that the end, the, you know, where I cut it in both places, um, that the waveform was not, you know, like this or like this, kind of matched nicely so I could you know, cross-fade it into each other. And uh, then use a little bit of time stretch and created some transients in there so I could um, move it around and still make it so it wasn't like, you know, sort of like, uh, 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 you know, kind of like that thing. When you, you know, sometimes that can happen when you cut and paste different clips and spots that they're not usually in. But the point I'm making is I got really creative with um, some... 
the uh, Cubase's elasticity algorithms with time stretching. And this creativity that I was able to apply to this situation with fixing this uh, specific note so I could really make it clear without, you know, distorting the sound or making it grainy or um, uh, any other issues like that. Um, I was grateful that I had practiced enough audio editing, which I've had probably a few thousand hours so far practiced at that since I started this business um, with vocals, with instruments, all sorts of things like that. And I had enough practice at these fundamentals that when I couldn't figure out another solution to something that I would normally use, like my mind was like, oh, I can't go back into the studio and record this again. I, the, 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 so the school's Pro Tools subscription has expired. I can't go back there. And I can't use the piano that's behind this camera right now um, because it, it wasn't tuned this whole time and every piano has a slightly different uh, timbre, sonority to it, right? And I'm like, I can't just re-record this. I have to use this somehow. And thanks to my practice at this, um, getting used to different ways of manipulating these audio clips and editing them so that they come off professional and clean, um, I was able to figure it out. Um, I ended up actually looking beforehand as well on a few forums and tried to look for a few videos with tips on you know, how, do you, how else can I get rid of this besides the normal you know, ways to, to do this on like Cubase forums and things like that. And everyone was, you know, not, nothing was coming up that was relevant to specifically what I was trying to figure out. Um, but because I had practiced enough of, you know, this audio editing um, stuff that I, I just, I kind of, I really like getting things very meticulously accurate with timing and um, harmonics and, you know, chord sequences and everything like that. Re really well planned, tightened up and, um, you know, usually leave a little bit of humanness in there because everyone, nobody likes robotic sounding music, right? Um, but this time I had spent um, conditioning both, you know, my hearing, like my ear training with this kind of thing, and just figuring out, almost having to improvise sometimes, solutions to things that I can't, I, I don't know how to fix off the top of my head. And uh, don't know, you know, if, you know, you know, school's not in right now. This Wednesday, school starts. So I'm like, I can't just go to a professor and say, hey, uh, any suggestions for this? You know, in the professional world, you got to learn to figure out this stuff on your own if no one else is around. If you have a client who has a track, they send you audio or something that, oh my gosh, this audio sucks. How do I make this this good sounding? You know, I've talked with a lot of producers who have told me about really bad horror stories. Oh my gosh, this guy's voice was so terrible. But with XYZ techniques, they told me, oh, I would try this software and this, you know, and we, we made it work. You know, there's things you gotta figure out, um, I've noticed in my own in my own work with clients on the fly, that, uh, you know, problems that you're gonna come up against that, you know, how, how, it's like, how do I fix this? You gotta be creative, you gotta be well-practiced enough in what you do to be able to figure out solutions sometimes on your own. And uh, this experience with this one little note that I just could not get that stupid little annoying click out of, I figured it out, got it to work. It sounds actually better now than it did before. <laughs> um, but just something to think about, you know. Uh, and I was only able to do this because I had mastered the fundamentals well enough to get a little bit creative and figure out a solution that I normally wouldn't have done. Um, because usually the, 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 the way I went about kind of working with the uh, elasticity algorithm with Cubase and the kind of messing around with clips and things like that, um, usually that doesn't work out too well. So they, they, there's a lot of risks in doing that. Um, you can actually create more problems than you solve by going that route. But I was able to figure it out. And the same applies with anything in your life. Um, for, for me also, uh, the thing applies with just regular old piano performance, uh, practicing and learning new pieces. Um, I have eight pieces currently from my junior and senior recitals. Two, three, four, oh, okay. Most of the eighth one. Seven pieces total, most of the eighth one. And I still have one or two more to memorize from my recitals. Um, and but I spent most of the summer memorizing that stuff and 
my junior recital material now because I have spent all those years, you know, I spent 10 years of piano lessons and a lot of practice time since then. I, I don't think I've gone more than one or two. I, I, might, maybe, I think I don't think I've ever gone more than one practice I've ever done. Um, every so often, maybe I'll just sit down and like play just cold turkey without warming up once in a while. Great while I'll do that just to kind of see, you know, where am I? You don't get a warm up practice chops, you know, where, where are those? I'll kind of gauge myself with that once in a while. But I will never, almost usually, I will never ever go a practice without, you know, getting really good and, you know, limber, loosened up in my forearms and my hands, um, going over and over and over the fundamentals, the scales, the chords, the arpeggios, um, and many different forms. Right now, my curriculum at SUU is um, uh, scales separated by a third and by a sixth, excuse me, by a, excuse me, scales separated by a sixth and by a tenth, and then um, there's uh, this alternate note pattern uh, type of uh, broken chord arpeggio thing that uh, I'm doing as well. But there's a lot of different ways, you know, that you can work on those fundamentals and but the key is get them down well enough so that when you apply your passions in a professional sense and you come up on a problem that you don't know how to solve, you've mastered the fundamentals well enough that you can be creative with them and solve problems that, oh, I didn't anticipate this in school. Those problems are going to come up and you've got to figure out how to solve them sometimes on the fly. And if you've got the fundamentals down well enough, you can usually figure it out. So whatever your passion is, Get so good at it. In fact, I'll end with a quote here um, from John Schmidt, from the Piano Guys. Um, the quote I heard him, uh, I saw from him, uh, from him online. Uh, it must have been the last few years of my piano lessons growing up. He said, and I, I might be paraphrasing this, but he said, practice so much, um, not to the point where, uh, or I'm getting this wrong, sorry. He said, how did he go? Don't just practice until you get it right. Practice until you never get it wrong again. Or until you annoy the family. <laughs> Whichever comes last. I don't know, that's that the last part's my my joke, but that was his his quote is practice not just until you get it right, but until you never get it wrong again. And uh that just stuck with me. I'm like Oh yeah, because, oh, I practiced, oh, I got it right. Okay, good enough. How do you know? Maybe it was a fluke. Next time you come around, you're gonna be able to do it the same way? Most likely not. I have never met a single pianist or never seen a single pianist ever who has played the same thing the exact same way two times ever. Like, we're human. Every single performance for pianists you do is gonna have some little differences scattered throughout every instance that you play something somehow, no matter how small, there's always little differences every time. Um, so just keep practicing and practicing and practicing. Um, get so good at the fundamentals that when crazy problems pop up, you won't get it wrong again. You'll be able to figure it out and fix it. So have a good one. Hope this helps somebody out there and uh, enjoy your music today.